Greetings everyone, and welcome to the first part of the Star Ocean Retrospective, where I'll be looking at the first game of the Star Ocean series. Well, the remake of the first game. Sadly, the original Star Ocean was never released outside of Japan. This was likely due to the fact that it came out in 1996, which was pretty much at the end of the Super Famicom slash Super Nintendo's life. As well, Enix of America closed its doors in 1995 and didn't reopen until 1999. So there was a four-year gap in which many Enix games, like Star Ocean, didn't see their way out of Japan. I'd be hard-pressed not to mention the fact that Star Ocean used a SDD-1 chip in order to push the aging Super Nintendo to its limits, so the cartridge was more expensive than your average Super Nintendo game. In fact, the original Star Ocean and Tales Fantasia were the only Super Famicom games to use this chip, which is attributed to that both games share a majority of the same design team, which you would know if you checked out Part Zero. You can check that out right here. Anywho, point being that Star Ocean First Departure is the only version of the game to be released in North America, although there is a fan translation of the original. First Departure uses a slightly enhanced version of the same engine used in Star Ocean The Second Story. It was released in North America on October 21st, 2008, published by Square Enix and released on the PSP. The original was developed by Triace, with the remake being handled by TOSE, who have ported all the SNES Final Fantasy games to the original PlayStation. With the game's history and background out of the way, let's get right to business. Is First Departure a remake worthy of the original, as in an RPG you should play? Let's get started. The story is largely the same in both the original Star Ocean and First Departure. The game begins by placing players in the role of Roddick, a young fellpool boy who with his two friends form their town's militia. One day, a strange epidemic begins to spread in a local village, with those infected being turned into stone. Players will later realize how petrification is the worst status ailment they could ever be afflicted with. It just so happens that this disease is actually the cause of a bioweapon used by an anti-federation group. It just so happens that Roke, the game's main setting, which is a planet you are on, is actually a developing world. Planets like Earth, yes, our Earth, have achieved man's dream of intergalactic space travel. Two Earth Federation officers meet up with our trio of heroes, breaking the undeveloped planet preservation pact in order to help them save their planet. Be prepared to hear about the underdeveloped planet preservation pact a lot throughout these games. It's a reoccurring theme. But alas, things are never so simple in a JRPG. It turns out the only way to create a vaccine to this petrification bioweapon is to have the blood sample of the virus's original host, who just so happens to be the archfiend of legend. Turns out he died 300 years ago, so our group of unlikely heroes travel to a sentient time gate and travel 300 years in the past in order to save the future of Roke. The game combines several plotlines of other JRPGs and combines them into one, which makes for an interesting premise, but it's all still very familiar and traveled ground for anyone that's a fan of the genre. Sadly, because of this whole time travel situation, most of the game's sci-fi elements take a backseat for the majority of the adventure, so it's just the usual sword and sorcery motifs for most of the game. All in all, the game's story is for the most part well told and fairly interesting. But there are a couple plot twists that actually surprise me down the line, but for the most part, Star Ocean First Departure's narrative is very familiar and a tad cliché. Regardless, I was still intrigued throughout most of the game, and it does get more engaging the closer you get to the big finale. However, like the Tales series, First Departure has a key focus on its characters. In fact, the game uses a relationship system that changes each individual party member's ending depending on whom they have a high or low affinity with. By engaging in skit-like private actions in various towns, characters will have various conversations with one another that can change the ending of the game. Affinity can also be gained by fighting alongside one another in battle. If two characters have a high enough affinity and one of them falls in battle, the other will enter a rage state and deal more damage. While affinity will change the ending for individual characters, the same overall resolution is the same regardless. Another interesting aspect of this game's character roster is that you can only recruit 8 of them. In the original game, there were 11 characters to choose from, 13 in First Departure. So, you'll have to pick and choose here, as you can't get all characters in a single playthrough. Some characters are only able to be recruited if you complete certain side quests or engage in certain private actions. As well, some characters will not join you if you have a certain character in your party. So if you want to see everything the story has to offer, you'll need to play this game multiple times. For the most part, each character seems unique, and I found it rather enjoyable to see how the story plays out ever so slightly differently depending on who is in your party. Some characters also have great dynamics with one another, like Elia and Roddick. Gameplay-wise, Star Ocean First Departure plays very similarly to some of the early Tales games. 
like Tales of Eternia. You navigate towns, dungeons, and overworld, and participate in random encounters using a real-time action-based battle system. Like the Tales games, you can chain normal attacks with special attacks, although you can't string all your attacks into coherent combos like Tales of Eternia. As well, you are only limited to equipping two special skills in battle, which is very limiting. Most encounters become very samey, as you can button mash your way through most of them as your controlled character will automatically go to and attack your targeted monster by simply pressing the attack button. It also does not help that the most part this game is quite easy, although later encounters will take much more thought and on your feet planning. Also, watch out for stone and paralyzed status ailments, as you can get a game over if all your party members become afflicted with either of them. The gameplay's biggest sin is Symbology, this game's version of magic, which stops battles to display an animation for each spell. So battles are initially quick paced, but come to a screeching halt whenever a spell is cast. This becomes much more problematic near the end of the game, as some party members will learn higher level magic that have longer animations, and you will encounter more spell slinging enemies. Luckily, most of those complaints about the battle system can be alleviated by the game's excellent skill system. Upon leveling up, a character will earn an amount of SP, skill points. These skill points can be distributed to a variety of skills that have wildly different effects. For instance, some may allow your character to break an enemy's defense in battle, or some may allow you to create useful healing items. Different skill sets are purchased from each town's guild building. The most useful skills are the crafting ones, that at a high enough levels will allow your characters to create weapons, armor, and accessories. Crafted items are typically the strongest in the whole game too. Players who strategically plan out their skill point displacement will be able to bend the game over their knee. As I found by the end of the game, my set of character skills made every enemy, and even the last boss, a total joke. Even though you can kinda of break the game by abusing the skill system, I still found it to be one of my favorite aspects of the game, and each level up feels all the more exciting and rewarding as you can use your earned skill points to master that one skill you've been waiting to get. Another aspect of the game I really enjoyed as well was all the various side quests and activities. Many of them reveal party member backstories and reward you with new characters or useful items. I also liked how talking to NPCs and towns would hint to where you would need to go to start some of these side quests. Aside from some of my complaints of the game's various gameplay systems, my biggest problem with the game is the lack of transportation for traversing the world. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem, but around the halfway point, you are required to visit almost every major town in the game again, aka backtracking. I had to make the journey on foot as well, and this just felt like padding. The only form of transportation you can get is through the monster taming skill line, which I was unaware of at the time of my playthrough, so I'm sure that would make the section of the game a little more bearable. Finally, my last complaint of the game is how the last four hours felt really rushed, which is a shame as I really liked where the story was going, but the game needed even just a few more hours to properly flesh out the end game. The game features some great 2D visuals that look awesome on the PSP screen, although I still love how the original game looks. Character sprites are well animated and have a lot of animations, and backgrounds in towns and dungeons look good as well, although some of the backdrops for battles look empty and bland. For the most part, this game looks great, and I like the anime character portraits that display whenever an important character talks. Sound-wise, I felt the game has some excellent music tracks, and many that are just simply good. Overall, I can say that the Star Ocean series contains some of my favorite songs of composer Motoi Sakuraba, and Star Ocean First Departure, for the most part, is no exception, although some songs are clearly better than others. One feature exclusive to this PSP remake is the English voiceover that plays throughout the game's cutscenes. For the most part, this voice cast does a good job and each voice helps flesh out each of the respective characters, although some characters' voices are a tad grating. My biggest problem with the voice acting is all the repeated battle cries and victory quotes that will be heard hundreds of times throughout the game. So even though I can completely admit this game is far from perfect, I still really enjoyed my time with Star Ocean First Departure. Even regarding all the game's many, but for the most part small issues, I can still safely recommend this game to fans of JRPGs. This game took me around 23 hours to beat, which admittedly is short for a JRPG, but the game is meant to be replayed. Sadly, First Departure is not available for download on the PlayStation Network, which is truly bizarre and is only available in physical UMD form. Physical copies are fairly easy and cheap to find, but again, a PSN release would be ideal as I'd love to see how this game would look on my Vita. 
So, that's it for part one. I hope you enjoyed my look at this highly underappreciated game. Hopefully you all join me for part two of the Star Ocean Retrospective where I'll be looking at what may be the best entry in the Star Ocean series. Star Ocean The Second Story and The Second Evolution for the PlayStation and PSP. As always, this has been Darren the Gaming Pilgrimage. Till next time.